showcase I said we're headed to the parallel sessions but of course we're not headed to the parallel sessions we're headed to the wonderful keynotes we've got keynotes three and four and I'm absolutely delighted to have both Anna and Jacques uh, join us uh, this morning it's morning here what's the time like for you Anna yes it's, it's three hours less so almost ah. nine o'clock <laughs> hey not bad not bad okay no. so <laughs> I'm absolutely delighted to introduce Anna. Uh, Anna is a lecturer in civil engineering at Federal University of Santa Catarina, where she's the vice director of the laboratory for energy efficiency in buildings. And she's developed research in the areas of building energy simulation, energy efficiency in buildings, and of course, thermal comfort. We talked a lot about thermal comfort over the whole conference. And she's also the president of IBIPSA Brazil. So we are thrilled to have uh, you here, Anna. And whenever you're ready, we're ready for your presentation. Okay, thank you for the introduction, Sukumar. I will share my presentation with you. Just a moment. Yes, I hope you can see the full screen. Yes, perfect. So, good morning, everyone. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. And I would like to thank you for uh, all the people that are organizing this conference. And this is a wonderful conference, a lot of stuff. And as previously mentioned, I will talk about energy efficiency and resilience of buildings. But today I will focus on some research that our group is developing uh, to tackle the problems in Brazil. So a really short outline here. We, I think it's important to talk about climate. Yes, climate is changing. About world population. Yes, it's growing and really fast. Uh, about some Brazilian contests and the goal and visions that uh, we are doing to track the problems. Our main ongoing research and some conclusions. So to start, I would like to talk a little bit about the latest new about IPCC. I think it's very important and I hope everybody knows about that because the world is going to set to reach 1.5 degrees Celsius in the, last, in the next two decades. And it's only the most drastic cost, cuts in carbon emissions from now that can help us to prevent an environment disaster. Considering the effects of climate change in heat islands, we may simulate buildings for climates that already present different behavior. The use of typical meteorological weather data files disregard extremely effects such as heat waves, and we should predict an increasing frequency and intensity in coming years. It becomes important to use historical series to understand the behavior of typical buildings during extreme events and how they affect the health and well-being of their occupants. Here, I show you just few simulations regarding uh, different uh, types of weather data from TRY, TMY, INEMAT from Brazil as well from different years from the climate of Sao Paulo, a city in Brazil. And here we can see that yes, the world, the weather, the temperature is changing, is getting higher. So yes, we can see global warming. So climate change effects will certainly impact the thermal performance of buildings as extremely events become more frequent and unpredictable. I'd like to show you, yes. So this visualization that you are seeing shows monthly global temperature anomalies between 1880s and 2021. White and blue color indicates cooler temperature and orange and red that you're going to see as soon as it moves, warmer temperatures. As you can see, global temperatures have warmed from mainly human activities at time has progressed. So the Earth average surface temperature has increased 
by about one degree Celsius since the late 80s. So human caused greenhouse gas emissions are the most responsible for the observed warm. So just wait until 2021. You can see the spiral in another position. And now you can see, yes, we have an increase of one degree Celsius. Yes, the population is growing and is growing really fast. So the latest projections say, suggest that the world's population could grow around to 9 billion until 2030 and almost to 10 billion in 2050. In 2015, more than 50 of the population was residing in cities and 80% will reside in cities in 2050. So the increase of energy consumption is an important topic of discussion, a sustainable and resilient human society. The current electricity power generation matrix in Brazil is predominantly renewable and the effect of climate change has already been felt. Recent water scarcity has limited use of dry hydropower and forced an increase in fossil fuel generation across the grid. So this is just an overview of a study that we developed here regarding room, no residential buildings stock in Brazil. The characterization presented here adds to the body of knowledge of the building performance analysis by including a country level analysis of several energy related building typologies. It presents an overview of the electric energy consumption of each building typology and the average of the floor space uh, varies widely for whole typology depending on different regions of Brazil. The energy balance of all energy source of the Brazilian energy balance according to each building typology is also presented here. This study intended to serve as a reference for building characteristics and building energy performance in Brazil and support diverse research regarding countering level, building stock modeling, energy benchmarking, climate change impacts, and energy efficiency related studies. Yes, we have climate changing, people moving from countryside to the cities, and we have dense cities. For sustainability, dense cities offer some advantages, including efficiency in land use, we can say. But there are also many possible negative or such major health problems resulting from urbanization, including nutrition, poor nutrition, pollution, disease, and for sure, housing conditions. Here, I present the contest of Brazil and many other developing countries. So to tackle this problem and to reduce the house deficit in Brazil, the Brazilian government launched the program Casa Verde Amarela, green and yellow house, we can say in English. So this is a possibility for low-income uh, families to purchase the house for a lower price than those in the market. Social housing is an important sector for expansion in Brazil and energy conservation within this sector should be considered However, including energy efficiency measures in projects in the social housing sector in Brazil, it's really difficult, especially in projects aimed at lower income levels, resulting in low construction levels, low income levels, and low thermal performance. Housing costs are seen as capital costs without considering the performance in the building life cycle. A cost-benefit analysis of building more efficient social housing is required in the country. So our main goal and vision 
is for a sustainable energy positive built environment with indoor environment quality optimized for health, comfort, and productivity. It requires a multi-scale approach which addresses technical, technological solutions for energy de generation, storage, distribution, and demand reduction, and integrates and optimizes this in design, construction, and operation of new and existing buildings. According to our experience here in our group, yes, <clears throat> building simulation can play an important role and can help us to achieve our goals. If you look and we if you try to understand, simulation comes from Latin, simulari, to pretend. And if you look at the dictionary, we can say a, a simple meaning. A model of set of problems or events that can be used to teach someone how to do something or the process of making such a model. Building energy simulation is a key element to assess building performance. It allows us to understand the influence of different inputs on the output, such as weather, elements, envelope, occupant, internal loads, and surroundings. Building energy simulation programs evaluate in detail the building thermal performance integrating a considerable number of input data and physical process. But for sure, we need to have reliable building energy simulation programs available in order to assess building performance correctly. Building energy simulation programs requi require expert users, detailed inputs, and considerable resources depending on the building complexi complexity. The users should be aware, should know that rubbish in, rubbish out. Or you should be aware that you need to answer the question right or to answer the right question. So after this introduction, I would like to show you our main ongoing research here in our lab, Laboratory for Energy Efficiency in Building in Brazil. There are main, the main topics are thermal performance and building energy simulation, thermal comfort and occupant behavior, bioclimatology, uber climate and sustainability. But today, I will focus on, on research that is related to energy efficiency and, resi and resilience of buildings that are Brazilian energy efficient labeling and also the energy efficient strategy, strategies for Brazilian social housing considering a life cycle perspective regarding optimization between thermal energy performance, energy consumption and cost. To start, I will talk, I would like to talk about the Brazilian energy efficiency labeling. So Brazil is the Latin America leading of the implementation of energy efficiency policy, policies. However, only 2001, the first energy efficiency law in Brazil was approved. Yes, only 2001. One of the outcomes was the regulation um, for energy efficiency for residential and commercial buildings in Brazil that was published in 2009 and 2010. The Brazilian labeling classifies building according to five levels, from A, most efficient, until E, least efficient. This classification can be based on two methods. One, regarding building energy simulation results, and the second one that uh, I'm, I would like to talk more, it's regarding meta models, the simplified one, the simplified method. Meta models are simple and affordable to use, but the accuracy of the results is strongly dependent on the building stock, climate, quality of the input data, and the modeling technique adopted in the development of the surrogate model. 
define the right trigger temperatures to window operation for natural ventilation or to use air conditioning is a challenge here in Brazil. As you can see in these figures, uh, in Brazil, we use cooling load during summertime, and we need really few heating load during heating time. And if you look at the natural ventilation one, if we set a temperature, uh, an operative temperature between 18 and 26 degrees Celsius, we can use natural ventilation most of the whole year. Yes, here in Brazil, most homes do not have air conditioning. However, this scenario is going to change in upcoming years. The climate is changing, the population is growing, and most homes in Brazil tend to use natural ventilation during the year. So they don't, they use the natural ventilation, but they don't have any criteria to use that. So this impacts significantly on the building energy consumption when the building is artificially conditioned. For this reason, we explore indicators that are able of estimating thermal loads only when natural ventilation is not sufficient to guarantee thermal comfort. Another challenge is to describe the occupant behavior when modeling hybrid strategies. For example, when and how systems are operated and, and when people are at home. Developing meta models that work for different climates is challenge, due to the wide profile of Brazilian weathers and the complexity of climate parameters. We do have eight bioclimatic zones in Brazil, and it, it's a huge country. So the use of machine learning techniques such as support vector machine, artificial neural network, deep neural network can help us to improve the accuracy between simulated and predicted. Also, thermal loads and thermal comfort indicators based on most influence inputs are also another challenge how we are going to set both of them. Uh, this is another work that we develop a meta model. So there's a tool to understand the performance and to improve the design and simplify the valuation of natural ventilation of low income commercial buildings in Brazil. The meta model was developed as a simplified compli compliance path for natural ventilation buildings to enhance Brazilian's commercial buildings labeling program. The meta model, the meta model serves as a design tool and demonstrate that modifying a small set of parameters can drastically improve the thermal performance and achieve sustainable comfort in hot and warm climate. Another challenge is regarding bin bin integration. We know that I there is a slow adoption of a new version of IFC by software manufacturers, limitation of, diff of geometric transformation from GBXML scheme. We do have loss of information regarding thermal properties of materials and occupation on term of thermal zones. It fails in export and import process by being tools, simulation tools. So a robust method to facilitate the application of energy label certificate, the Brazilian label certificate to bring to being softer was also developed. So a reduced number of input variables in the bean model was required and a detailed geomet uh, geometry was not required. Regarding that, we could analyze through a big program, uh, the labeling, the Brazilian labeling certificate. Another uh, research that our group is working on, uh, was working on in the end, it finished. 
So is regarding the optimization between thermal energy performance and energy consumption and cost. So due to the importance of social housing sector in Brazil that I previously presented for you, it's necessary to analyze in a more holistic manner the impact of what is being built to create a foundation for improvements with proposed housing that generates lower long-term environmental, social, and economic impact related to energy use and climate change scenarios. The main goal of this research is to establish optimal cases for energy efficient in social housing projects in Brazil, considering life cycle cost benefits analysis. Two building typologies, a single family house and a multifamily house were taken into account to cover most of the characteristics present in the buildings located in Brazil. Different energy efficiency measures were evaluated, reducing energy consumption by means of energy efficiency strategies contributes to maintaining natural resources and support health coexistence between human life and nature. Clarifying the amount of energy and what energy has been used is key to achieving efficient, effective energy efficiency strategies. So energy efficiency measures for the building envelope were evaluated in lower income sectors, representative projects of single and multifamily typologies, considering thermal performance, energy consumption, and cost. The measures estimated in terms of macro components allowed comparative evaluation and association with costs. So here is the combination of all simulation resulted in this scatter plot by typology on the left and by bioclimatic zone on the right. So as the previous said, we do have eight bioclimatic zone in Brazil. The number one is the cooler one and the ZB8 is where the cities with warm climate are located. So here we can see that we have the demand, perfect, the cooling, the, the thermal load, and we do have across in the X, we do have comfortable hours. So based on that results, we can see the energy efficiency measures, the frequency of occurrence of each strategy. And this one, we have done that for the whole bioclimatic zones in Brazil and for the two typologies adopted. This is the example for the single family house. So here we can see that we can achieve case with higher comfortable and lower thermal load necessity. So based on this result, it was plotted all the cases with combined energy efficiency strategies. So the blue dots are the efficiency strategies and the orange dot is the reference case. So the cases located in the right and the lower are the better, okay? Then we selected only cases with superior performance regarding the comfortable. Then we selected the ones with lower life cycle, life cycle cost. So those one, only one or two were lose here. And then we compare it to the reference case. The, refer the, the reference case is how the social housing in Brazil are being built during the whole year. Then we selected just the optimized case based on life cycle cost and thermal comfortable. Then regarding those case, we observe the initial and operational cost from the first year and we could see that it's possible to achieve some strategies that can be considered 
in the beginning of the building of, to build the social housing in Brazil. So if we compare here, the reference case is there is an initial cost less than those ones, but if you look at the operational cost, we can adopt that easy. So the result of this research that we have done here, it resulted in a decree. It's really important for our country. So now it's mandatory to follow this decree to build social housing in Brazil. You can see the year here is 2022, 2022. So it presents the minimum requirements to build social houses in Brazil. Together with this decree, we have a guidebook to inform the minimal requirements for each typology. Sorry, it's in Portuguese, but I would like, I would try to translate for you. We have the minimal requirements for multifamily multi housing, single family, for different bioclimatic zones, for the eight bio bioclimatic zones in Brazil, each one represented for one color. And we have here living room and dormitories. Why those rooms? Because those rooms, we have extended periods of use. People habitate these rooms more frequently than corridor or bathroom, for example. Then, just an example how the guidebook inform you. So here is an example for the single family house. Here you can see that we have some requirements for window, for shading, and regarding the thermal transmittance for wall and roof. As well, we have the colors, the solar absorptance, the minimal required for the wall and the roof as well. Another example for the multifamily, you can see that the color change. So here we have cities that we have extremely summer and we have to consider different types of windows and blindings for living room and also for dormitories, for bedrooms. And here we have the values for the, also the thermal transmittance and colors for the wall and roofs. So the result of this research uh, had, a, had, had a real impact uh, uh, in Brazil nowadays. So concluding the climate and the matrix, the energy matrix are changing. Buildings are becoming more complex and those buildings are inside the city. So building performance simulation has a very important role in more sustainable and resilient buildings in cities. And building performance simulation is important to, deve to develop and to apply energy and performance labeling schemes. So please mind the performance gap. Thank you for your attention, and I hope you have enjoyed it. That is absolutely brilliant. Thank you, Anna. It was such a wide-ranging um, talk uh, covering so many aspects that are absolutely fundamental um, to, to this context of Brazil. Um, I was really struck by that one picture you showed of that informal settlement on the left-hand side and this very sort of manicured, perfect, formal settlement on the right. And, it, you know, in that one picture, you've captured almost all the sort of complexities of, you know, what it is to, to live and work and design in the developing world. Um, so it was really um, pertinent to, excuse me, the conference as a whole. So... Uh, very thought provoking and there's lots of um, interesting ideas and thoughts and really congratulations on getting it into into the decree it's a sort of uh, thing that we are all uh, hoping and wishing and praying for that our research is actually converted into into policy and I think Rajat's uh, showed some lovely work uh, earlier today 
on how some of their research has now gone into a portion of the new residential energy code. And it's really fantastic to see uh, what you've put together for decree number 532. Um, but the thing that I loved about decree 532 was actually not just the things you should do, but also the lovely red crosses telling you, don't go there. <laughs> you know. So I thought that was fantastic. Um, so um, we haven't had any questions. So to the audience, please pop your questions into the Q&A channel as always. Uh, what we will do is in the interest of time, we I think we onboard uh, Jacques and then maybe we can take combined uh, questions and answers for both Anna and Jacques towards the end before we shift into the panel sessions. So Jacques, are you happy to, uh, are you ready? Yes, thanks, Sikawar. Um, I am ready. I'll share my screen um, and I just want to make sure that you can see everything. Yeah. Uh, but just before that, uh, let me just briefly introduce you. Hang on a second. Yeah, I'll get, get your screen. Get your screen. All right. Yeah. Okay. Is it visible? Not yet. Let me just see here. Trying um, try again. Right. Right. Yes, um, we have. Uh, screen but we can see your notes you might have to just yeah, change the... just one moment there it's my settings uh, yeah there we go that should do it okay. Uh, it's gone back into. Oh, maybe uh, maybe try the second setting, duplicate uh, one. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, and we got you, it. Can you now see the primary screen? Yes, absolutely. Wonderful. All right. So um, let me uh, briefly introduce you, Jacques. Uh, so Jacques is a professional architect and research and innovation professor at the Department of Architectural and Industrial Design at Schwane University of Technology in Pretoria uh, in South Africa. And um, Schwane is one of these um, universities, um, you know, there's what's called a historically disadvantaged um, um, uh, university. Is that, is that, am I using the right terminology, Jacques? Please correct. Yes, yes, that's correct. And his past research has focused on the regulatory gaps between the formal and informal building economies of South Africa. So once again, really, you know, following on beautifully from Anna, some of the work that Anna showed uh, just uh, a few minutes ago. Um, and he's recently established the Building and Built Environment Ecology Research Group, which explores resource consumption in the built environment of the Global South. And they use an ecosystemic approach whilst evaluating existing complex systems and predicting future interrelationships. So uh, I think these are really wonderfully complementary talks uh, we are having this morning. So I'm going to hand over straight over to you, Jacques. Thank you very much. OK, thank you, Sukumar, for the introduction. And also thank you for bringing all of us together. Um, uh, it's really a privilege for me to share the work that we're doing um, with such an esteemed audience. I'll start off with the background. Um, uh, uh, we're on the southern tip of the African continent and um, uh, I'm located in Pretoria, which is the capital city. If we look at Pretoria, it forms part of what was previously, or it forms part of a larger uh, municipality, the city of Tswane. So in May 2011, smaller municipalities were being incorporated into the city of Tswane. Official statistics indicate that we're the third largest city in the world, but it's only when we measure it by area. It's approximately six and a half thousand square kilometers, and we've got a population of 3.3 um, million people. 
with 65,000 students, TUT or the Twana University of Technology, where I'm from, is the largest contact university in South Africa. Um, uh, we have six campuses, three within Pretoria, and then also three more in neighboring provinces. So um, we've got uh, four pillars on which we uh, um, base our educational offerings, our research, our community engagement, and also administrative processes. And those are, we're looking at future ready graduates. We want to have our research being impactful and also innovative. We strive for operational excellence and also for digital transformation. But as a university, or not as a university, but it's in addition, as a university, we're really cognizant of the sustainable development goals, and in particular, its role in Africa. So I'm in um, the Faculty of Engineering and the Built Environment. And within the faculty, we have um, specific goals that we strive towards through. And those are goals number six, seven, nine, and 11. So goal number six, ensuring availability of sustainable management of water and sanitation. Number seven, ensuring access to affordable, reliable, and sustainable and modern energy for all. Goal number nine, where we're looking towards building resilient infrastructure, we're promoting inclusive and sustainable industrialization whilst fostering innovation. And then goal number 11, we are attempting to make our cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. So those four goals are really important within our faculty of engineering and the built environment. My talk today is about simulation and optimization without building energy and efficiency codes. And in essence, I'm asking, we're doing all these exercises and um, we're trying to simulate the built environment, but do we know what the essential codes are and what are those um, premises on which those codes were developed? Um, uh, um, Rajat spoke earlier about developing reliable data sets. Similarly, Davey, David spoke about replicability. And those are, um, and, and you spoke, Sukumar, you spoke about fit for purpose. So with building energy, and efficiency codes, particularly in the global south. The question is, are we using what is applicable, what is contextual, or are we simply importing and duplicating um, global north standards and trying to force them into a global south environment? So, when we look at automated building energy performance simulation, there are three primary tools, namely a space boundary tool, an energy tool, and a mechanical tool. And with mechanical tools, I uh, just want to make sure everyone understands I'm talking about an architecture of insulation as opposed to an architecture of ventilation, where insulation primarily uses a, an HVAC system, as opposed to architecture ventilation, where we have openable doors and windows, which allows for natural ventilation primarily. So um, we've got the space boundary tools that originate from the architectural design, the energy tools, also, it closely aligns with applicable building energy and efficiency codes, also with external energy load generation and internal energy load uh, generation. And then lastly, we come to the mechanical tools, as I said, mostly HVAC data sets. And these are the three primary um, 
sections that we use in our simulation input files and finally uh, for the simulation um, engine. But building NFG performance simulations, as I've said earlier, are often questionable, especially when we're looking at the consumption or the operational phase of a building. And earlier mention was also made of building occupant behavior and you know, the combination maybe um, when we had um, presentations on um, the UK India collaborations. Also, how do we use qualitative data? And the qualitative, in, in, in my opinion, is usually influenced by occupant behavior. So coming back to this, um, when we look at the global south, a central problem for me in what we're doing at the moment in simulation and optimization exercises are the energy tools. Um, in, my, or in our research, we don't see applicable building energy and efficiency codes being implemented uniformly in the global south and in a number of instances where there are codes and they're implemented, they give little consideration to the global south context or to the specific internal and external loads. And those three factors give rise to a questionable simulation input file. So, Interoperability and contextual, um, uh, contextual response remain um, the main challenges. And it's compounded when we use different software. And um, to try to understand interoperability, um, it is necessary to look at the BIM methodology and also the building information management and building energy management integration. Um, the, the BIM method, uh, methodology is summarized, but what you'll see now is the particular challenges that we're facing when we're looking at the physical model, the context or location, the energy model, the reiterative energy simulations and um, accompanying adjustments, and also the statistical analysis of the upgraded model. So for the Global South, we've identified these four critical areas where the information is questionable. So the availability of building energy performance simulations that we're importing from the Global North is good as a case study. But when we're considering the methodology, we see that accurate information for the Global South is lacking in those highlighted four areas. Um, similarly, um, understanding the building and its context forms an essential part when we're looking at BIM and BEM integration. <clears throat> Sorry. So the question is, what does the global south look like? Um, and what I'm trying to do now is to give a contextual snapshot of what we find in South Africa. <clears throat> so in 2016, I came across a mail online article. It is by Lucy Morris, and it featured 15 poignant photographs by Johnny Miller. Um, who is a Cape Town based photographer. And he started using a drone's eye view to give us a perspective on how people live in South Africa. So the Papua Si Golom golf course is located on the slopes of the Ungeni River in Durban. But it's almost unbelievable that the sprawling informal settlement are meters away from the T of the sixth hole. 
and the separation is is a low slung fence that um, acts as a barrier between tin shacks um, and these carefully manicured fairways. Miller's images portray an alarming picture um, as seen in this buffer zone between the two townships in, um, in the Western Cape. According to Miller, um, uh, and in summary, an aerial perspective provides new insights into how people live and what they are doing on the ground. It allows us to see things as they really are. And as an architect and as modelers and built environment professionals, we cannot be immune to what is happening on the ground. Because if we um, do not acknowledge that, we're simply modeling um, for models' sake. So in um, 2012, nearly a quarter of South Africa lived in tin shacks. These were hastily constructed structures using the cheapest possible materials. But often, urbanization and increased densification also resulted in a um, illegal service connections. And these are examples of those illegal service connections where people are too poor to pay for electricity. And so we have an electricity demand and only a part of the population can afford that. Although uh, almost the entire population is using the electricity. And in South Africa, we use coal-powered um, um, stations to provide our electricity. And then here are examples of how these structures simply become permanent. So these hastily constructed um, buildings or homes with materials that offer little indoor environmental comfort easily become permanent accommodation. So our challenge is looking at South Africa's formal building economy versus the informal building economy. The formal building economy in South Africa is highly regulated. The informal building economy there is simply no form of regulation. Services um, are problematic. Um, something as simple as a fire engine or a fire truck being able to access in between these informal settlements. The roads are simply not wide enough to accommodate um, the fire extinguishing or the fire brigade during a fire. So in South Africa, as I said, this formal building economy and informal building economy exist alongside each other. But both, uh, both economies are vulnerable to climate change. The people accommodated in the informal building economy, those are the people who are most at risk. Miller's work shows that the situation is not unique to South Africa. As I said at the beginning, Unequal Scenes, which is um, uh, the name of his website, it started as an aerial photography project in 2016. He looked at South Africa. But today, it visually defines the lines of inequality from Cape Town to New York, and in particular, Miller emphasizes the vulnerability of communities and how they're simply existing alongside each other. So I want to move now to where the global self actually is, because that's a, a very um, uh, important question in our work. 
The term global south is occasionally used or uh, used by scholars and politicians to describe economically disadvantaged countries, developing countries, or third world countries. The Brunt line, which is indicated in red here, it's a visualization and it was created to illustrate international inequalities and the socioeconomic gulf separating different regions of the world. Although the Brunt line is widely used in research, this geographic delineation is much more complicated than what this term suggests. One of my doctoral students, Tarin Gaum, investigated the Brunt line and we made recommendations on how the line should actually be adjusted to accommodate a, a current status quo. So the frequency of extreme weather events worldwide is hard to ignore. The following three slides that I'm going to show are adapted from the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction. Um, in 2020, they published a report titled The Human Cost of Disasters. And they looked at 20 years. And the report confirms how extreme weather events have dominated the disaster landscape in the 21st century. So between 1980 and 1999, um, 4,212 disasters linked to natural hazards caused approximately 1.2 million deaths, deaths and affected more than 3 billion people worldwide. The economic losses amounted to uh, 1.6 US trillion dollars. Similarly, in the last two years, we've had, uh, this has doubled. Um, what was initially there for 20 years um, has doubled to almost 7,500 documented disasters. And it claimed 1.2 million lives around the world. Asia suffered the highest number of disaster events as we can see in this figure. So in total between 2000 and 2019, there were just more than 3000 disaster events in Asia. This was followed by the Americas and um, Africa. So there were 1,700 approximately in the Americas and 1,200 events in Africa. Worldwide floods are the most common type of disaster um, with uh, approximately 44% of the total events. When we standardize this information to population size, the top 10 list of countries with the highest share of affected population is dominated by Africa. Uh, Africa, um, and, and this is unfortunate, hosts six of the top 10 countries on the list. So the top 10 countries or territories by absolutely death tolls is reflective of mega disasters of the past two decades. Here we see that Haiti, Indonesia and Myanmar are taking the top three spots. Um, in Haiti, um, in 2010, the earthquake killed approximately 2% of the country's population in a single event. So if we compare the three data sets, the vulnerability of the global south is evident. When we use the Brunt line as the delineation or the boundary between the global north and also perhaps reflecting on its um, preparedness for climate change and the events that associate that versus the global south. Now, in um, the conference uh, or on the conference website, 
it says the global south alone is expected to nearly double its um sorry current global built floor space by 2050 and it also indicates what we can expect during the operational phase and uh, the consumption so if the global south is nearly doubling the current global built floor space by 2050 our buildings that we are building now will have an impact on carbon energy and health for more than 60 years to come and that is alarming um, because i'm not sure that we understand its impact and perhaps we might understand it, but certainly our politicians and policymakers have no real commitment to addressing um, this challenge. The COP27, uh, COP27 that was held in Egypt during November 22 was described as an all of Africa COP. Um, the conference of the party presidency defined the summit's four key goals, um, mitigation, adaptation, finance, and collaboration. I'm unsure whether these goals will be met, but especially given its financial implications. So we need to look for alternatives to make it financially viable to meet these very ambitious goals. One of uh, the possibilities is to look at a contextual response based on global south and global south interaction so greater collaboration between global south countries could assist in meeting these goals it's important to identify the lowest hanging fruit and to simulate and optimize resource consumption in the global south we need to understand the unique characteristics of the global south. One of my doctoral students, Tarin Gom, currently investigates similarities in the global south built environment. For a thesis, she developed a new building energy and efficiency code decision making model. But to arrive to the, at, to the model, she used three selection criteria to identify the biggest role players. Uh, and those were the highest CO2 emitters, um, the 2050 projected urban populations, and also distinctive climatic characteristics or climatic zones. The countries um, with the most significant or the biggest projected 2050 urban growth were included in the model. The increase in building stock is directly linked to urbanization. But with that also comes energy consumption. And that energy consumption is both embodied energy and operational energy. We also looked at the highest CO2 emitters and included those while she was developing the model. So when we're considering buildings energy use and emissions during the operational phase, the direct emissions also include emissions from coal, oil, natural gas, and biomass. Indirect emissions are um, attributed to power generation for electricity. Um, it doesn't matter, uh, or rather, let me phrase this differently. When we increase urbanization, our building energy consumption increases accordingly. When we're looking at predictions of different sources and studies, the greenhouse gas emissions will increase over the next 30 years. The variances um, depend on the particular study or the agency producing the information. So we looked, or Tarin Gaum, through her thesis and through her doctoral studies, looked at similar climatic conditions also 
on the respective continents. And we use the Koppen Geiger climate classification of the global south. And after considering the three criteria, um, 57 global south countries were identified for inclusion in her study. Uh, this one is supposed to play with the video. Let me just see if I can get the video. Uh, uh, sorry. Okay. Okay, no. All right. Um, unfortunately, the video is not showing, but here, what, what you would have seen in the video is when we look at climatic conditions, a country like Argentina and South Africa share similar climatic conditions. And therefore, if we look on a global south, global south interaction, the building energy and efficiency codes that are currently used in South Africa could possibly be adapted for use in Argentina. And those could form a baseline for future development in similar conditions. So if we look at building um, energy and efficiency codes in the global south, it was also necessary to determine which countries have codes and which countries are without codes. So she started off and she identified the countries in red which had no codes. Moved on to countries where the codes were in the, under development or voluntary. And here I want to again refer to Argentina as opposed to South Africa and just bear it in mind that it's now voluntary um, in Argentina. Here we see countries highlighted where it's partially mandatory. And then we come to countries where building energy and efficiency codes, or at least a minimum code is mandatory. So coming back to the example of Argentina and South Africa, if we look at voluntary codes versus mandatory codes, there could be a global south, global south interaction to develop future building energy and efficiency codes. The global south, as I said um, earlier, is most vulnerable to the effects of climate change. And there are various reasons for it. Uh, the global south is not prepared for it. Inadequate funding is problematic. An increase in population growth and urban concentration. And then also the increase in economic prospects resulting in um, greater resource consumption. Rajekar um, earlier said, as household incomes increase, in India also, um, uh, then we will see uh, an increase in use of air conditioning systems. So an increased economic prospects will also, or do result um, in greater resource consumption. The disastrous impacts of climate change are frequent and acute. The most recent IPCC report found that almost 3.3 billion people now live in a highly vulnerable climate context. It's also estimated that approximately 10 million people are displaced by the floods in Pakistan. And the most vulnerable communities are those who are least responsible for climate change. And at the same time, they don't have the resources to respond to the climate change impacts, and they will continue to be at the front line. So worldwide, we need planning, engineering, and building regulatory codes to address the, these challenges. Currently, planning, engineering, and building regulatory codes are not doing enough to prepare the current and future built environment for the reality of climate change. And this is where I especially enjoyed Anna's talk, where on a visual uh, and accurate way, she depicted how houses 
should address um, uh, future resource consumption. So ideally, to address the need for building simulation and optimization in the global south effectively, we need to facilitate knowledge interaction. That should, the knowledge interaction should be contextually appropriate. And at the same time, we need to address the identified gaps to effectively simulate and optimize building energy performance, building information management, and also building energy management. And given the contextual differences between the global north and the global south, we need to understand the challenges of the global south. The building energy and efficiency codes that are currently in use in the global south can be developed. Otherwise, the global north building energy performance, simulations, and optimizations are questionable paper exercises. Then I'd like to thank you as an audience. Um, as I said at the beginning, it's a privilege to be able to share what we're doing in South Africa with you. I'd like to thank Sukumar um, and his team for organizing this platform. Um, uh, I am really amazed at the work that everyone is doing and also actually at the synergy between um, the different teams, although we're mostly operating in isolation. I met Sukumar, Tristan and Bashar um, as part of a Newton funded project that started in 2017. And thank you for your generosity, um, for sharing your knowledge and your time. And then lastly, I'd like to thank my two doctoral students, Henry and Tareen. Um, it's a privilege to work with you and thank you for um, your efforts and dedication to addressing the global south knowledge gaps. Thank you, everyone. That's absolutely brilliant. Thank you, Jacques. Thank you for this very, very um, thought provoking uh, talk once again. Um, and actually, in a way, thank you for sort of so sort of forensically directing our attention towards the global south. Um, and I think it's sort of the ideal talk to, uh, you know, as sort of the the sort of um, uh, to bring our keynotes together in a way because we had uh, Rajan talk about his work in India and then Wolfgang talking about his work in places like Singapore and then we've had Anna talking about Brazil and then you taking South Africa but actually expanding it out into into the global south has been absolutely fantastic um, and in fact, I mean, some of the work you showed, I mean, with the uh, that unequal scenes uh, pictures, some of these problems are not isolated to the global south, you know, they carry on well into the global north and there are uh, disparities and inequalities and vulnerable populations communities, uh, even in the global north that could actually benefit from this sort of thinking. Um, and yes, I, like you, I was um, I was uh, pleasantly surprised and in a way reassured by the um, similarities in in approaches and ideas and the sort of uh, the fact that um, a bit like Rajan, you know, Rajan's talk was a, a long obedience and he said we kind of all need to be facing in the same direction and kind of working in the same way. And yes, even though we are sort of working in isolation, um, we are looking it seems to me um uh, more or less in the same way um and i think this idea of sharing this global south to global south cooperation is something that's not very much valued at this point you know much of the on certainly on the research side the funding models and i i think even on the innovation side uh there tends to be much more talk about global north to global south but actually we could learn a lot more between Global South countries and especially comparing, um, you know, if, if a particular country, say like South Africa, has moved from voluntary to mandatory codes, uh, well, actually, another country that might be looking to do the same thing could avoid the, the sort of the inevitably painful process of learning about how to implement these and their relative successes or failures and actually, you know, circumventing uh, problems as they emerge rather than trying to go through the same thing and reinventing the wheel. So, you know, uh, I absolutely take that on board. Uh, and 
looking back uh, at Anna and and once again her work on this decree. I'm I'm really quite fascinated by this uh, this decree that you put together, Anna. I think it's it's a really um, neat way to move the, the the discussion forward and actually taking stuff from these large scale simulations that you've done uh, and moving them into into something that's actually affecting the lives of millions of people. And as Jacques said, um, as we try and formalize um, um, people who maybe might be currently living in more informal settlements and you know, there are lots of government programs to build social housing, the last thing you want to do is to build something that's not fit for, fit for purpose and fit for the future. Um, and actually doing the sorts of things you've done in Brazil, I think enable us to ensure that, you know, these buildings will be hopefully resilient and fit places to live and thrive. You know, it isn't just about meeting minimum standards, you know, people should be enabled to achieve their best potential. And actually we forget the, the importance of, of buildings and comfortable places and, um, uh, places that um, uh, enable you to fulfill your potential, you know, the, the shells that we work in and live in are really, really important. Um, there haven't been any questions, so I guess we're getting away with it. Uh, I guess everybody's been so stunned by the, the, the wonders that you both have presented. Um, and given the fact that the parallel sessions are due to start in about a minute's time, I think we will uh, maybe bring this session to a close. I really would like to thank both of you for taking the time to come and talk to us from totally different parts of the world. You guys are literally sitting on different continents from us, which is which is fantastic. You know, this is what we wanted uh, when we set the conference up. Uh, so thank you very much for that. And I think we will close. I hope you both will stay. I know you're, oh, are you chairing sessions? Uh, Anna's chairing a session. So I've got to, definitely got to let you go. Jacques chaired a se session for us yesterday. So um, see you all there. Thank you very much once again. Thank you, Sukuma. Thanks. Bye.